Let's pray, and then we'll dive in here to Revelation chapter 20. Lord, we just want to give you praise and thanks for who you are, because you're worthy of our praise. You are high and lifted up. You are exalted, and we just magnify you in our worship, and now as we study your word together. We trust that you will be magnified as we study scripture and and uh, apply these things to our lives. And as we get a glimpse of the things that are to come, as you were telling us here through Revelation, we just pray that our hearts would be prepared, that we would um, just have your peace, knowing that we're trusting you, even though in our world things will get crazy and chaotic. We're trusting you, Lord, and we know that you are coming again. So our hope is fixed on you, the author and finisher of our faith. And we thank you for our eternal reward, our eternal home in heaven that you have kept for us. And Jesus, you even said that you go to prepare a place for us. And if you go to prepare a place for us, you will come again and receive us unto yourself that where you are there, we might be also. So we thank you for that promise that you're coming again and you're going to take us to be with you forever. So help us not to be afraid, but help us to be watching and waiting and looking forward to your imminent return. We love you. We praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, let me uh, walk to the back wall here and take a look once again at our infamous timeline. As we've been looking through the book of Revelation, we find ourselves now here at chapter 20, the thousand year millennial reign, which is actually redundant. When we say millennial, we're talking thousand years. So it is, it is the thousand year reign or the millennial reign, take your pick. But what the Bible teaches us is that following seven years of tribulation that's coming upon the earth, that's chapter six through 18, took us a while to get through that, it's pretty heavy stuff, that Jesus returns to the earth at the end of the tribulation period, settles the battle of Armageddon, uh, is victorious over the armies that have advanced against uh, Israel and the God of Israel. And, uh, and Jesus then establishes his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Now, there's more to come after that, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Just for tonight, we're talking about the millennial kingdom or the thousand year reign. Now, I will tell you before we even look into chapter 20 that there are three common ways that uh, people interpret the idea of the millennial kingdom. And so I'm gonna walk you through these three things, but we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. One of the views of how you uh, look at the millennial reign is called the amillennial view. The amillennial meaning ah meaning no or not millennial. This is the concept that there will not be a literal thousand year reign. This is uh, how some people believe that when Revelation 20 is talking about the thousand years, that it is symbolic, that it's not literal, and that the thousand years are just symbolic of the church age, the period in which we are presently living. So if you believe that, then you have to also believe, which people who hold to the amillennial view do, that Satan is currently bound during this time period. And they still would tell you, though, that the tribulation is going to come after which Jesus will judge the living and the dead, and then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So the rest of their view is is pretty consistent in terms of there's a tribulation, there's a new heaven and a new earth. But those who hold to the amillennial view don't believe that this is a literal thousand year reign. And you'd be surprised the people who hold to this position. Augustine was somebody famous in the fourth century who held to this position. Uh, The Roman Catholic Church, by and large, holds to this position. Some Baptists hold to this position. It's the amillennial view of uh, the thousand-year reign of Christ. I don't subscribe to this, but I'm just telling you this is one of the views. Uh, The second view of this this time period is called the post-millennial view. That is, that Christ returns after the thousand years. Thus, we get the term post-millennial. The thousand years are seen as literal and thought to be the time of the greatest harvest of souls leading up to the return of Christ. There's a problem with the amillennial view and there's a problem with this view. Well, there's a few, by the way. The amillennial view teaches that Satan is already bound. Um, If Satan is already bound, we're in big trouble. Because as crazy and sinful and evil as the world is, you mean to tell me that you think Satan's bound, but we got all this craziness. So there's a problem there. The problem with this one 
is that the Bible actually teaches that there will not be a great harvest as we get closer to the return of Christ. The Bible actually teaches there will be a great apostasy as we get closer to the return of Christ. The Bible teaches that there will be a falling away, that people will not put up with sound doctrines. They will gather around themselves teachers who will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. Now, listen to this because this is not a contradiction. There will be a great advancement of the gospel, okay, because of technology and, and the ability to get the gospel around the world. But as we get closer to the return of Christ, Jesus even tells us in Matthew 24 that the love of most will grow cold and there will be a great falling away from the faith. So there's going to be an apostasy. So that's a major problem with the post-millennial view. It's, it's this idea that, that, you know, Jesus comes after the thousand year period of time and, um, and that there's a great harvest of souls leading up to that. And we see quite the opposite, actually. There's an advancement of the gospel, but there's a great apostasy that happens. The last view is the premillennial view. That is to say that Christ returns at the end of the seven years of tribulation, which marks the beginning of the millennial period. Thus, he returns premillennial. And he establishes his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. Believers will rule and reign with Jesus during the millennial kingdom. This is the view that we hold to. So this is going to be the angle that I'm teaching from when we look at Revelation chapter 20. But again, you know, we, we need to be reminded of the things that are to come. And uh, when, we, when we think about uh, Satan being bound right now, well, that, that's just ridiculous. And, and when we think about a great harvest, unfortunately, there's going to be a great, a great apostasy as we get closer to the return of Christ. Now, obviously, people will still come to know Christ. Um, but at the same time, there's going to be a great falling away. So... We need to be mindful of this. As we come here to chapter 20, take a look in your Bibles with me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, with you tonight at verses 1 through 6. And then I'm going to take you to other passages, particularly of the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah is rich with a description of what life will be like in the millennial kingdom. Revelation just tells us that there will be a millennial kingdom, but it doesn't tell us too much about what life will be like. So I'm going to take you to other passages of Scripture where Isaiah the prophet and uh, Zechariah the prophet speak about what things will look like in that day to come. They prophesied about the millennial kingdom too. So I'm going to take you to those passages in a little bit. But first we're going to unpack the first six verses here of chapter 20. And John writes this, then I saw, and you'll notice he's going to use that phrase five times here in chapter 20. Then I saw, he, this is full of visions here. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Okay, so uh, John sees here this vision of an angel. This is not J Jesus. This is an angel. But this angel has been given authority by our Lord to, to bind Satan. And he has been given the key to the bottomless pit. Now, if you have an NIV, I'm reading from New King James Version. If you have an NIV, instead of bottomless pit, it, it says the word abyss. And uh, either abyss or bottomless pit is fine because it's the Greek word abusos. It's where we get our English word abyss. And the word abusos is used only nine times in the Bible. One time in the Gospel of Luke and eight times here in the book of Revelation. The time that it is used in Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 31, you remember this encounter when uh, Jesus um, it goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee where there is this man who is possessed by demons and uh, Jesus commands the demons to come out of this man. Now, when Jesus uh, calls this demon to identify himself, he says, what is your name? And the demon says, we, uh, my name is Legion for we are many. And uh, a legion in the Roman Empire was uh, 6,000 soldiers. So were 6,000 demons possessing this one guy? I mean, how many demons can possess one person? One is too many. Amen? I mean, I, you need 6,000? One is too many. Okay, but the other thing you have to remember is, you know, Satan is a liar and the father of lies, so his demons are going to lie too. So maybe there was only one, but there had to be more than one. We just don't know if there were 6,000. There had to have been, you know, a lot possessing this guy because here's what happened. In Luke 8, 31, the demons spoke to Jesus and begged him before he cast them out of this man. The demons begged Jesus, do not send us to the abyss. 
Abusos, Luke 8, 31, same word used here in, in Revelation uh, 20, verse 1. Don't send us to the bottomless pit because the Bible tells us that there were the worst of the demons reserved in, in chains in the abyss, in the bottomless pit. If you'll jump backwards, the book right before Revelation is the book of Jude. If you look at Jude, it's only one chapter, so go careful or you're going to miss it. But in, in Jude, verse 6, In Jude verse 6, it says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. Okay, remember, there were a great number. It doesn't tell us the exact number. It tells us a third of the stars were swept by the tail of the dragon. A third of the angels in heaven, however many that represents, rebelled with Lucifer when Lucifer rebelled against God. There was this coup in heaven. And Lucifer, or Satan, devil, got kicked out of heaven. And a third of the angels with him. And it tells us here in Jude 6, and the angels who did not keep their, their proper domain but left their own abode, he, the Lord, has reserved an everlasting chain under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, that isn't to say that every demonic principality is kept in chains in, in the dungeon of the abyss, because we know that demons in the spirit realm have, you know, this potential to, to influence uh, people's lives and our world. But it is to suggest that the worst of those demons were kept under under chains in, in this uh, dungeon here, in the abyss, waiting for the judgment day. And so God, you know, I mean, think about how terrible demons are by themselves, but God, even in his mercy, kept the worst of those demons from tormenting or harming people and those he has kept in chains in the abyss for the day of judgment. So uh, when, when you think about these demons, then having this conversation with Jesus in Luke chapter eight, don't send us to the abyss. They're like, we don't want to go where the worst of us are. You know, it's bad enough when you're a demon and you don't want to be around another demon. And so they're like, don't throw us into the abyss. Those are some really bad demons there. And that's when Jesus sent them instead into the herd of swine. And then the swine ran off the cliff into the Sea of Galilee and they, they committed suicide. All right. <laughs> they became d deviled ham. But anyway, so um, that's what happened there in Luke chapter 8. Pray for me. It's just a twisted sense of humor. Um, but, but they were begging him, don't send us to the abyss. That's the abyss we're reading about here back in Revelation chapter 20. So you can turn back there now. So, so an angel comes down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, to the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. That's also what we read in Jude 6 about, the, about a chain. And it, and it says here, and he, that is that angel, laid hold of the dragon. Okay, now notice the different terms here for, for Satan. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So it's as if, you know, God just wants to make sure we know who's being bound here, just so that we know. This is the dragon, this is that serpent of old, this is the devil, this is Satan. Got it? Got it. All right. Now, the idea here of these different terms, you know, the dragon is the name by which Satan is known in the book of Revelation. The serpent of old is a reference back to Genesis chapter 3. The first time we're introduced to Satan in the Bible, he appears as a serpent in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. He's the one who convinces Eve and, and Adam is right there along with her um, and doesn't intervene and doesn't take some spiritual leadership. So they both end up believing the lie that God is depriving them and that if they would eat of the fruit, which God told them not to eat, that they would, their eyes would be open, they would be as wise as God. And so Satan tempted and appears there at, in the Garden of Eden as a serpent. So that's that reference to the serpent of old, who is the devil. The word devil in the Greek is diabolos, diabolic. Somebody who's diabolic is, is evil, but diabolos literally means accuser. And also known as Satan, which is really his Hebrew name, spelled the same way, Satan, meaning adversary or enemy. And he's bound. A chain is, is bound around him, and he's cast into the abyss for a thousand years, for this millennium. Yeah, praise God. Um, and, um, and he's bound there for that thousand years. Verse 3, and he, the angel, cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. And set a seal on him so that he should, so that he should uh, deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. 
But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Why? <laughs> if you haven't read that verse before, that should at least cause you now to ask, why? Why if he's being bound and they put a whole, they wrap him in chains, put a seal over him to make sure he's not going to go anywhere, but then he's going to get released at the end of the thousand years for a little while. If you jump ahead to verse 7, same chapter, just look at verse 7. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number it is as the sand of the sea. Here we go again. This is, sounds very similar to, to what happened in Armageddon. It's like Armageddon 2.0. We'll talk about this in a minute. Why would God do that? There's a reason. But for the moment, let's get through the rest of the verses here. So back at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Now, he sees here thrones in heaven, and he says, and they sat on them. Who's the they? Well, when it tells us here that judgment was committed to them, it gives us a little insight into who the they are. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 2, if you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Paul would say this, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? You see, God will use believers as his um, understudies, if you will. He will use believers in that day to help him rule and to reign. He will give believers authority to judge the world um, at, at the end there of the tribulation as we come into the millennial kingdom. And so he gives believers that authority. So in Revelation 24, when he sees thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them, since Paul tells us there in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, that it'll be the saints, it'll be Christians, believers who judge the world under the authority of Jesus, then the ones he sees here are believers. Those who have already gone to heaven, they've died, they have been, they, they either were raptured before the tribulation, or they died before the tribulation, and they're in heaven. Those are those saints. That's the first group he sees. But then he sees a second group here, back in chapter 20, verse, the rest of verse 4. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So the second group he sees are also believers, they're also saints, but he distinguishes them from those who died before the tribulation. These are the saints who died during the tribulation. These are the saints who were martyred for their faith. They were killed because of the word of God. They did not deny their testimony, their witness for Jesus, for the word of God, and they did not worship the beast, which is the Antichrist, or his image, and they did not receive his mark, 666, on their foreheads or on their hands. And so they're, they're killed for their faith. Now, back in chapter 15, if you want to just glance back at chapter 15, it, it tells us uh, in verse 2, uh, John sees this group of martyrs uh, in heaven in, in Revelation 15, verse 2, and I saw something like a sea of glass. Now, a lot of times I've mentioned to you that whenever you see sea, uh, S-E-A, in, in the book of Revelation, it almost never means a body of water. It almost always refers to what, an expression we would say, the sea of humanity. He's looking out over a vast number of people like a sea of glass, mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, these, these are the same people, the martyrs during the tribulation period, they had victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, and then the song is listed there. So there in chapter 15, John actually sees these martyred saints around the throne of God with harps worshiping the Lord. So they are brutally treated on earth. They are martyred for their faith. In fact, it, it tells us uh, back here um, in um, chapter 20 that when it says that they had been beheaded, 
Uh, so it tells us exactly how they are killed. They are martyred by having their head cut off. So it's brutal what happens to them on earth. But there in chapter 15, John sees this vision of them, though, their spirits in heaven rejoicing around the throne of God. You know, things might be terrible on earth, but remember, there is the ultimate reward of heaven. And things might get miserable in your own life, and things will certainly get miserable during the tribulation period for many on the earth. But for those who call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved, and our eternal reward in heaven will be a wonderful day, and it will make all these other things pale in comparison. And, and Paul, Paul would write that. He would say, I consider my present sufferings not worth comparing to the glory that awaits me in Christ Jesus. And so we have to hold on to that hope, amen? That is the hope of the church. Amen. So, so John sees here, back in chapter 20, he sees the saints who have either been raptured or died before the tribulation. That's the first group. He sees the second group. Those are the souls of those who were slain, martyred uh, during the tribulation because they refused to deny their testimony in Jesus. They refused to take the mark of the beast. They refused to worship uh, the Antichrist. And, and, he, and he says there in verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, when he says the rest of the dead, what he means is the unsaved dead. The unsaved dead are going to be judged at the end of the thousand year period. But those who are experiencing the first resurrection... Uh, are those who have died before that judgment. And that's why he adds in verse 6, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. In other words, all those saints who have died before the tribulation and those saints who died during the tribulation, all the saints throughout history who died before the tribulation and those saints who died during the tribulation are considered part of the first resurrection. And, and he adds there, over such the second death, that is when unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire, the second death has no power, but they shall, meaning the saints, they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. If you go back in Revelation chapter 1, go back to the beginning of Revelation uh, chapter 1 and verse 6. We see something similar, this whole part about being priests of God and of Christ, reigning with him a thousand years. In chapter 1, verse 6, actually the middle of verse 5 says, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, verse 6, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. If you go to chapter 5, look at chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 says, and they sang, and when you see the context, it's talking about this, the saints in heaven, and they sang a new song. I'm in chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, you, Jesus, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. So all this very similar language, go back to chapter 20 now, where um, verse 6 ended by telling us that, that again, over such the second death has no power, but they, that is the saints, shall, shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, you know, as, as priests, we're just, we're going to be serving Jesus. We're going to be representing him uh, to the people. You know, in the Old Testament, a priest was someone who, who stood between basically God and man and represented God to man and man to God. Now, Jesus is our high priest. So, none of us need to represent one another to God uh, because Jesus has done that on our behalf. But we're going to be called priests in the sense that we will still represent God to other people. Why? Because remember, when we go into the thousand year period, there will be survivors, human beings living on earth who come through the tribulation period who will then be living in the millennial period of time. And during that millennial period of time, life is going to go on as usual. 
So this is where it leads me now into kind of a summary of some things related to what is life going to look like during the millennial reign. And, and again, life will go on much like it does now for the righteous who enter into the millennial period, the righteous survivors of those who have survived the tribulation, the righteous survivors of the tribulation will go into the millennial kingdom. All right, the saints come back with Jesus. All right, so, so we'll, we'll have our, our glorified body. We come back with Jesus. We help administer the nations. We help administer the world. We rule and reign with Christ, under Christ, of course. While there are people who have not yet experienced death, they survive the tribulation period and life goes on as usual for them. They will have jobs. They will go to school. Sorry to tell you. They will, they will uh, continue to, you know, have families, get married, have businesses. They'll drive cars. They'll, they'll fly airplanes. They'll play sports. They'll go on vacation. Life will happen very much like it does now in the millennial kingdom with a very, very big difference. And the very, very big difference is there will be no more political powers. Amen. Amen. There will be no more presidents or kings or prime ministers or dictators, there will be one monarch and that king will be Jesus over the whole world. So try to imagine life where Jesus is on the throne. He's the only king over the whole world. Okay. The saints are ruling and reigning with him. And first thing on the list we've already talked about is, and Satan is bound during this thousand years. Can you imagine life where Satan is bound? Now, People, because they are still human beings who survived the tribulation, come into the millennial kingdom, still have a sin nature. It's not like there will be no sin during the millennial period. There will still be sin because there will still be human beings with sin natures who are bound to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. So it isn't to say that there's going to be no evil because Satan is bound because there's still human beings with fallen sinful natures. Even though they've been, you know, made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. It's the same for us presently. I mean, you, you, you can be a believer and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior and still have a flesh to deal with. The devil doesn't have to help me. My flesh is strong enough. Okay. But it will be to the benefit of the world that Satan is bound. Because there will certainly be less evil while he is bound because his influence will not be there among people and among the nations. So that's the first thing that is good about the millennial kingdom. Now, Jesus will rule from Jerusalem and Christians will rule and reign with him. That's what we already read there in verse 6. And then what's going to happen is there's going to be a judgment of the tribulation survivors. Everybody who survives the tribulation is not necessarily right with God. There's going to be plenty of people who, are, who have denied God, rejected Christ, and there's going to be those who survive the tribulation who haven't yet been martyred, okay, if you can escape the sword, there will be those who will escape the sword. They will manage to survive. They'll have some bunker in Montana because they're preppers. And, uh, and so they'll manage to survive and to still live. And, and even though they're Christians, if you try to get their food, they'll shoot you off the front porch of their house. That's the problem with being preppers. You understand this, right? If you're, if you're into prepping and you're like, you know what? Things are going to get crazy and we got to prep and stuff and I got to stockpile food. Okay, great. But as soon as people start showing up at your house, what are you going to do? Kill them? So, you know, all of this is challenging. Anyway, <laughs> there will be those who survive the tribulation who are believers and who are not believers. And so one of the things that's going to happen is a judgment of the tribulation survivors. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew 25. I'm going to read you the verses, verses 31 to 34. He says, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy ones with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. This is the difference between believers, sheep, non-believers, goats. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But then later in verse 41, Jesus says, and then he will also say to those on the left hand, represented as allegorically goats, figuratively, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
Something else that we, that we learn from Scripture about the time of the millennial kingdom is it'll be a time of great peace and joy. This is from Isaiah. Now, Isaiah prophesies a lot about the millennial kingdom. Here's what he says in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. See, no more n need for war. They're going to take their swords and bleed them into, uh, beat them into plowshares because they need the spade of the plowshare to be harvesting and you know, plowing the field. But they don't need to be fighting anymore. And their spears will be changed into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. The day of the Lord is that the house of Jacob Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Another interesting thing that Isaiah tells us about the millennial period is that it'll be a time when animals will be tame. This is going to be returning to the days pre-flood. You didn't see there was hostility between the animal kingdom and human beings until after the flood. Prior to the flood, in the Bible, animals and human beings peacefully coexisted. But it'll be a return to that in, in the days of the millennial kingdom, Isaiah 11, verse 1, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow up out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious." So when you think about the Prince of Peace coming to bring peace to the earth, it will be so infiltrating of every aspect of our world that even nature, even the animal kingdom will be at peace with people. Kids will be playing with snakes. Can you imagine this? Moms will be saying to their kids, get off the PlayStation, go outside and play with some snakes, would you? <laughs> and they're going to be fine. Another thing we see in the Bible that's going to be happening is that there's going to be longevity that will come upon the earth. People are going to, are going to live to, uh, to ripe old ages compared especially to how we, we live today. This is out of Isaiah chapter 65 verses 19 to 25. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Again, life is normal. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. 
The verses there earlier that I read talk about how it's going to be unusual if a person doesn't live to be 100. They will think, well, what's wrong with you? And so there's going to be longevity. Again, this is going to be a very different world. And when you think about all the aspects that affect longevity, and, and some of those things are going to be removed, people are going to live a lot longer on the earth. And who wouldn't want to? As long as you have Jesus on the throne, it'll be a great day to live long. And then it tells us here, the last thing I'll, I'll leave with you is that the Bible also says it'll be a time of worshiping Jesus in Jerusalem. This is out of uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 to 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to the Feast of the Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. And in that day, they shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. It's very interesting. There is somewhat of a return to the feasts, but it is not as it was directed in the Old Testament to point forward to the Messiah. It'll now be feasts unto the Lord in looking back at what Messiah has done. In much the same way that we take communion today. Because it is a looking back on what Christ has done for us on the cross. And in that day when Jesus rules and reigns from Jerusalem, people will bring sacrifices, the Feast of Tabernacles. They will come to the house of the Lord and they will celebrate Him, not looking forward, but looking now in the present and past as to what He has done for us. I leave you on this point. Why is it that Satan will be released at the end of the thousand years? Here's the reason. The people who live during the thousand year reign, during which time Satan is bound, will be living in a utopian society. I mean, it, it will be, life will be wonderful in the sense that Jesus is king, the prince of peace is ruling, Satan is bound. Other than their own flesh that is still bent towards sin, uh, there is no real um, choice there. I mean, it's just Jesus on the throne. And so in order for those people who lived during the millennial period to be offered choice, who do you want to serve? You want to serve the enemy or do you want to serve the Lord? They have to be given choice in order for them to come freely to the Lord. Because up until that moment, they have no choice. They're serving the Lord. He's the only one. Satan will be allowed to be released for a th after the thousand years is over one last time to deceive the nations. You know what is so sad, and we'll get into more of this next week. What's so sad is that m these nations gather. And so it goes to show, how is it possible? You're living in like a utopian society. The Prince of Peace is on the throne. Life couldn't really get any better until we eventually get to heaven completely. But I mean, why would you be persuaded to follow Satan if, if you have life so wonderful under the lordship of Jesus, it just goes to show you the wickedness of the human heart. And it goes to show you the powerful delusion and the deception of Satan. We'll talk more about that next week. But for tonight, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you thankful for the cross, thankful for what you've done for us, Jesus. We look forward to not just the millennial kingdom when you rule and reign on the earth, we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth to be with you forever and ever. We thank you for your word, Lord, that teaches us these things that we might be ready. We love you, Lord. We praise you together. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen.